Hello everybody, welcome to today's lecture of ecology. Today we're going to talk about stress and adaptations driven from the ecological range. We talked in the last lecture. My name is Divna Djokic. So for the beginning, uh, just a quick reminder, I guess you remember the bucket. So the Leibig's law of the minimum says that a uh, specifically limiting factor is the one that the species is mostly sensitive to. Uh, a bit, a small update on it today will be the limiting factors of this law of minimum, and the, those two are ex that this law only is valid under stable conditions, and when you talk about it, you definitely need to consider the interaction of the other factors. So the example would be to, let's to imagine, for example, a CO2 to be the leading limiting factor in a random lake, and then productivity is considering CO2 in the balance with the, of the uh, availability of it in the, in the lake, and that uh, CO2 comes from the matter decomposition. So if we if we um, imagine that the uh, light, uh, nitrogen, phosphor, etc., are uh, available enough, so they are not a limiting factor. So imagine that there's um, imagine there's a bad weather and it brings a lot of CO2 in the, in the lake. So the the amount the level of productivity would change and then become dependent on a different factors. So if the the level of production changes, there's no uh, stable state and there's no minimal factor. So the reaction depends on on concentration of all of the the, the needs of a plant or or um, creatures living in, in in that random lake. So the the level of production would change uh, constantly until the one of the factors become a limiting one, and from that moment onwards, the lake would go back to its previous normal state and start functioning under control of the Leibig's law of minimum. For the consideration of different factors. The good example is that a uh, high concentration of some matter can be modified uh, dependent on the usage of it. So, for example, the plants that live in a shade uh, have less demand for zinc than the ones living in the sun. So the zinc in the ground is a less limiting factor for the, the plants. Uh, with the ecological uh, needs of a shape. And there's a, a, a slight modification of Leibig's law that Timon in, in 26 brought in. And he, he said that the, for the function of an organism, the most important ecological factor is that the organism has the lowest uh, val valence for and that's uh, specific for the growing stadium that it's most sensitive. For example, in humans that will be kids, for example, to have healthy teeth and, and to eat a lot of calcium and, and so on. I believe you remember this graph from previous presentation and in there it was the same graph, the same self is law of tolerance, but the graph there was talking about fitness or physiological fitness of the of the species of physiological tolerance. Uh, but here it's uh, what's represented is the fitness of uh, species as uh, in the matter of population. So how it influenced the uh, physiological context influenced the population uh, fitness and stability. So here it's better represented. So what happens is that in the optimum range there are species abundance. Species abundance is really high. It's widespread in the zones of, of physical physiological stress. It's much less in the zone of intolerance. There's a uh, absolute species abundance. And 
This happens when something changes in the environment, uh, different makes the environment different to the conditions that the specific species is used to. It's again the story of, of the really fragile connections in the nature. So, good example for this story are oysters uh, and ducks story in North America. So, what happened here is that when they built the, the duck farm in the coast, there was a lot of products, byproducts of ducks uh, ending up in the w nearby water. So, the balance between nitrogen of nitrogen and phosphorus got uh, uh, interrupted and then the specific population of phytoplankton that was growing in that area was was corrupted and some other species t took over the area it had for the consequence the high rate of mortality of oysters because the oysters were feeding on that specific um, species of phytoplankton but then when this new phytoplankton groups came the oysters were not able to digest them so they just died out of hunger another classical story to be an example of this is the oxygen usage in the water considering its temperature so the higher the temperature of the water is the solubility of uh, uh, oxygen rises and the usage of it also rises because the metabolic rate of, of uh, sea creatures rise as well. So, so the ectotherms become more active the, the higher the temperature is, they use more, use more oxygen. But it happens only till the uh, certain extent above which would say that's optimal range but then above it there's a zone of physiological stress the higher temperature gets it gets worse and worse there's less oxygen um, the metabolic rate starts increasing rapidly till the moment of the of the death of the this species uh, zone of, of intolerance still it's good to know that living creatures are not only slaves of their surrounding there are actions of the nature that influence the biota, but then biota is uh, able to produce a certain reaction to it to start to try to prevent or to adapt to it. So this could call be called the factors of compensation to the change of the environment. We talked about this in previous uh, presentations about how. Uh, the level of tolerance for different factors is different in different species. Most we're going to talk about uh, is animals and plants because uh, those examples are most easy to to explain and to understand. But this is definitely valid for any living creature on this planet. So the, there are three main options how the species can adapt to their surroundings. So the reaction or or factor composition is morphological, physiological, and behavioral. For example, physiological be acclimation, the more typical one, or dormancy, and then estivation as a diapause, and uh, hibernation, then circadian changes or photo periods, so the change of the of the length of the day, and it's all to reach the homeostasis, which would be the equilibrium. Of, of reaching the optimum range of physiological functioning of the species and uh, it's nice to mention that this can be also considered as a bioindicator so bioindicator would be the species that that is um, specifically uh, sensitive to a certain factor and then we can use them to see the change in the environment so the story of the corals, again, they're really um, sensitive to changing the temperature of the surrounding water. So if you see they are not living well, the, their population is dropping or they're becoming sick, they are serving as bioindicators for the temperature change of the, of the water. This ability to, to adapt uh, to the changes in the sur surrounding uh, leads to so-called ecotypes and for example for ecotypes with the acclimation what this means is that 
uh, you have a sp single species, but they have varieties depending on the area they live. So it can be a genetical race, so a small change in genetics without real physical uh, expression of it, or it can also be uh, only a physiological adaptation, which will be the less smaller level of change. This is one of the reasons why uh, regular uh, taxonomy keys cannot be completely taken for granted anymore because there are many examples where species are basically different but their uh, anatomical appearance is still the same but then genetical level they are changed and there's this big this discussion of how you can define a species or a race or subspecies or superspecies and so on but the, the main idea of this is that they are all of them are just the consequence of the change in the environment and the uh, animals adaptations to it so if the if the change is strictly dependent on the area that the species live in but it's still the same species it's called the ecotypes and it's locally adapted population so you have let's say the same species of, of bears the dark bear that lives in uh, Iberian and, and Peninsula and Balkan Peninsula, they are genetically slightly different, so they're still considered as the same species, but they have this subspecies or ecotypes of Balkanicus and and Pyrenees. And the story of this is also the meta populations, those are uh, isolated populations that also change during the the some period of time, but this actually didn't happen due to their change to the environment, but they just, for some reason, stayed really isolated from the rest of their population. For example, the river became bigger so they cannot swim over it anymore, or the big gap uh, arised due to the big earthquake. So they're physically really apart from their mother population and they're also change different change genetically and that's different than ecotypes so meta populations are not the same as ecotypes uh, this is an example of the ecotype so there's this uh, medusa species Aurelia Rita, uh, depending on the area they live so in Tortugas or in Halifax in Can Canada they are in both areas they are still considered as summer animals but the optimum area of their temperature of the water is different due to the different climate uh, conditions in the different geographical area they became adapted to this would be like the introduction to the next presentation where we're gonna talk about separately plants and animals but here in general they have different strategies of, of adaptation but this they have the same goal so to to reach the physiological does populational optimum uh, in the certain surrounding by adapting to it with different strategies so it's important to mention that on one hand, the animals more rely on their um, ability to to have the social interactions or to uh, change the environment the way they need. The plants are more uh, tied to the ground, so they express more some types of morphological or physiological adaptations. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. See you in the next presentation. Ciao.